Namo tassa bagoetto, araheto, sama, some Buddha sa, Namo tassa bagoetto, araheto, sama, some Buddha sa, Namo tassa bagoetto, araheto, sama, some Buddha sa. In the previous lecture, I spoke about the third council and um, the role of uh, King Asoka and Mogali, son of Tissa the bhikkhu who was the senior advisor to the king and how they purged the sangha of false monks and decided on what was the orthodox view, which was called at that time the Vibhajavadans. That was the the primary business of the council and the reason it was called, but the council also followed the precedent of the first and second councils in having what is called a rehearsal, going through the entire canon to agree on the, uh, the text. And at this time this included the, the Pitaka of the Abhidhamma Pitaka. So it, it's considered that at the Third Council, the canon was closed. The one addition was made, a very important addition, was made to the canon at that time. The book that's called the Katawatu, the Points of Controversy, the final book of the Abhidhamma and the, the final book of the canon, said to be composed by Mughali himself, as a summary of the positions of the various schools that were deemed heretic and their refutation by the Vibhajavadins. May be that the text we have has some additional sections that were added later, but the bulk of the the, the work dates to this time of the, the Third Council. It's translated in English as the points of controversy by um, the Polytech Society, and it was a joint effort by Shui Zan Ong, Burmese, and Mrs. Rice Davids, British. The work is not organized in a completely logical fashion. It has the same sort of semi-random arrangement as most of the books in the Buddhist canon. But it does cover most of the existing schools. The most points against any one school are addressed to the Andakas, which is that school that was most <clears throat> in contact with the Theravadins later in Sri Lanka. So this, this point leads to the suspicion that maybe there were some additions later because I don't think the Andakas were that important already at the time of the Third Council. There is a fairly lengthy section uh, on the nature of time to refute the, the Sarvastivadins here called uh, Sabata Vadans, using the Pali version of the name. The very first section of the book is a refutation of the Pugalawadan view. That's not, Pugalawadan is not technically the name of a school, but of a, an opinion or a view that was held by several, several schools at the time that held that there is such a thing as a person existent outside the, the five aggregates. So it's a very much a, um, a movement away from the core doctrine of the anatta. So it was felt quite, I, obviously it was felt quite important to refute this view. And it's, it's the refutations tackle the, the problem from a couple of different directions, which we see elsewhere through the book, there is often a purely logical 
formal refutation that usually takes the form of bringing out the implications of a view until some contradiction is discovered. And then it'll say something like, what you said at the beginning does not match what you say at the end. You are refuted. The other line of argument is scriptural to cite uh, sutta references. And this is actually employed by both sides in many of the, the debates, quoting um, various statements of the Buddha to support or refute a view. There's also another fairly lengthy section on the nature of time, which is addressed to the Sabatawadans. And uh, many other topics are covered. Many of them are very obscure points of Abhidhamma and the way causality works and the, the, the relation of uh, different mental states and so on. There's also, uh, early on in the book, actually in the second chapter, there is a refutation point by point of the five, or a version of the five points of Mahadeva addressing the Mahasangikas, which we uh, discussed earlier was the um, precursor of Mahayana and attempted to uh, denigrate the... the uh, Accomplishment of the Arahant. The very first one of these, I'm looking for it in the book now. The very first one of these is the controverted point that an Arahant has impure discharge, which is uh, a euphemism for emission of semen. The uh, Theravadan says, you contend that he may have, yet you deny that in an arhant there remains any lust, sense, desire, or assailing passion, any fetter, flood, bond, or hindrance of sensuality. But this denial commits you to negate your proposition. You admit that the average worldling may have this one and the other, both desire and physical result. But then you must also admit both true in the case of arhant. What is the cause of that physical impurity which you impute to the arhant? And the uh, uh, interoculator, who is identified as a Pubasilia, one of the schools that uh, adhere to this Pugalawadan doctrine, says, the Dewas of the Mara group convey it to the Arhant. Have then these Dewas themselves that physical impurity? No, in them it is non-existent. Then you should not say that they convey it to the Arhant. From who do they convey it? not, you affirm, from their own bodies, nor from that of the Arahant himself, nor from other beings, which is absurd. You deny also that they affect the conveyance through the pores of the body. Then you should also deny that they convey it at all. What do you allege is the reason of their conveying it? Their idea is we shall cause doubt as to his attainment. Is there a doubt in an Arahant? If you reply no, then your argument falls through. If you reply yes, then you must admit that an arahant may hold doubts about the teacher, the doctrine, the order, the ethical training, the beginning and end of time, either or both, and about things as happening through assignable causes, which is absurd. The average man holds doubts about such things, but an arahant does not. And this argument goes on for some pages, which indicates that these five points of and this is only the first of the five points, that these five points were considered important enough to address seriously, because this was, after all, the first major split in the Sangha. Another um, important topic uh, is addressed, as we said, the Mahasamgikas, besides denigrating the status of an Arahant, they... Uh, exalted the state of a Buddha to a kind of deity-like position. And uh, one, uh, one of the um, controversies is addressed to the Uetulyakas, which was a, a, a group of Mahasamgikas, 
that said that it is not right to say the exalted Buddha lived in the world of mankind. They held that the Buddha never left uh, uh, to see to heaven, but only sent a nimitta, a created form to the earth, to uh, an illusory form to promulgate the teachings. The Theravada reply is, but are there not shrines, parks, settlements, villages, towns, kingdoms, and countries <clears throat> mentioned by the Buddha? And was he not born at Lombini, super enlightened under the Bodhi tree? Was not the norm wheel set rolling by him at Benares? Did he not renounce the will to live at the Chapala shrine? Did he not complete existence at Kusanara? And moreover, was it not said by the exalted one, Bhikkhus, I was once staying at Ukata in the Subhaga wood by the king's sal tree, or I was staying once at Uravala by the goat herd's banyan tree, or I was once staying at Rajagaha in the bamboo wood of the squirrel's feeding ground, or I was once staying at Sa Sawati in the Jetha's grove and the Pandika's park, I was once staying at Wesali in the great wood of the great gable hall. Surely then the exalted one lived among men. And the uh, interlocutor says, but did not the exalted one born in this world, enlightened this world, having overcome the world, undefiled by the world, hence it is surely not right to say the exalted one lives in the world of mankind. This is another peculiarity of the Katawatu that many of these discussions, the non-Taravan school often gets the last word, as in this case. There's no further, uh, further text on that point. But then it goes on, that the very next question is that it is not right to say the Exalted One himself taught the norm, meaning that's their translation for the Dhamma. The Exalted One himself taught, it is not right to say the Exalted One taught the Dhamma. By whom then was it taught? By the special creation, by the Nimitta. Then this created thing must have been the conqueror, the master, the Buddha, supreme, the omniscient, all-seeing, Lord of all, judge of appeal of all things. I again ask, by whom was the norm taught? And then the um, debater changes his position, and he says, by the venerable Ananda. Then he too must have been the conqueror, the master, etc. But was it not said by the exalted one, Sariputta, I teach the norm concisely and I may teach it in detail, and I may teach it both ways. It is only they who understand that are hard to find. So surely the Buddha himself taught the norm. And the position of, um, of the Mahasangikas is then, is in this section is brought out in a few other examples. One is that even the excreta of the exalted Buddha excelled all other odorous things. And we find this odd idea promulgated in several of the uh, Mahasangika branches, that even the, the excrement and urine of the Buddha was more fragrant than perfume, which is, again, the attempt by the Mahasangikas to deny any human status or attributes to the Buddha. And the Theravada refutation of this is that would imply the exalted one fed on perfumes, but you admit only that he fed on rice and gruel, hence your proposition is untenable. Moreover, if your proposition were true, some would have used them for the toilet, gathering them, saving them in basket and box, and exposing them in a bazaar, making cosmetics with them, but nothing of this sort was done. One a, a kind of a curious uh, pair of controversies regards the, uh, the guards in purgatory and animals in heaven. And there are several of these debates concern the nature of existence in, in other realms. And this, is, this to me is curious because on these two points, the Theravada seems to take an opposite position. In uh, as a bit of background, um, to begin with, 
the what th this translator calls purgatory, often they call hells. They're the Naraya realms, the realms of suffering for those who commit very grave commas, particularly of violence and cruelty. They're reborn in Naraya. And there are two classes of beings in Naraya. There's the Naraya Sata, which are those beings that have been reborn due to their kama in the hell realm. And there are the Naraya Pala, the hell guards or wardens, the demons who torture them. And it was the Theravada position that the Naraya Pala are also actual beings that have their own consciousness and kama that were reborn into that realm. But other schools, such as the Andakas, held there was no such beings. They're only illusions generated by the kama of the sufferer. The Theravada says here, Do you imply there are no punishments inflicted in the purgatories? You maintain the contrary, but you cannot maintain both propositions. You admit that on earth there are both punishments and executioners. You deny the latter exists in purgatory. But then the very next controversy concerns animals in heaven. Heaven being the, the sagas, the, the realms of the devas. In many of the uh, accounts, particularly in the Omanawatu, of the heavenly worlds, when the pleasures and beauties of the world are described, they often include things like songbirds and uh, white horses that pull the chariots and so forth. The... Um, Theravadans held that, that uh, these are not real animals but only illusions. So they take the opposite case here relative to the hell worlds. So the controverted point, and it's not identified which school held this, but one of the uh, heretic schools held the position that animals may be reborn among the Dewas. The Theravadan reply is, do you then imply that conversely Dewas are reborn as animals or that the Dewa world is an animal kingdom, that there may be found moths, beetles, gnats, flies, scorpions, centipedes, earthworms. You deny all this, then you cannot maintain your proposition. But is not the wonderful elephant Aravana there, the thousand wise yoked celestial mount? But are there also elephants and horse stables there, and fodder and trainers and grooms? Well, it's not uh, stated here, but elsewhere I've seen that the, um, the elephant of, of uh, the gods, Erawana, that the, the gods go riding on, is said to actually be an ordinary dewa that can assume the form of an elephant when he chooses to to uh, serve the the higher dewas there's a debate on the intermediate state and this is something that comes up continually uh, in the history of buddhism down to the modern times there is a um, controversy about whether when a person dies, whether they are immediately reborn or there is some kind of intermediate state in which they exist. And we, we know in Tibetan Buddhism this has been elaborated into quite a, a system with the idea of the bardos. But many schools of Buddhism held that there, that there is some kind of intermediate state whereas the orthodox Theravada position, as found in the Abhidhamma and the commentaries, is that the moment of death is immediately followed by the moment of birth, and in the case of a womb-born birth, like a human birth, uh, it's the moment of conception in the womb, is immediately the next mind moment from death is, is rebirth or conception. This was uh, denied by many of the schools, probably most of the schools, and there is some scriptural basis for, for um, postulating an intermediate state. There's this, the talk of the Gandaba that seeks rebirth, and there's been scholarly articles written about that, what that might mean.
I would say even to the present day, although the official kind of academic, highly orthodox Theravada position is there's no intermediate state, the common belief in most Buddhist countries is there's some kind of a, uh, intervening period where the person exists as a kind of a ghost before taking rebirth. I'll just deal with a, a couple more here. One is uh, the controverted point that our religion is or has been and may again be reformed or made new. And the commentary says, because after the three councils, the differences in our religion were settled, some, for instance, certain of the Uttara Patakas held that it has been reformed. And there was such a person as a reformer of the religion, and it is possible yet to reform it. And the Theravadan replies, what then has been reformed? The applications of mindfulness, Satipatthana, the supreme efforts, the steps to Idi, the moral controls, the moral forces, the seven branches of enlightenment? Or was that made good which has been bad? Or was that which was allied with various things, intoxicants, fetters, ties, yokes, floods, hindrances, infections, graspings, and corruptions, been made free therefrom? You deny all this, but your proposition implies one or the other. Do you mean that anyone has reformed the religion founded by the Tathagata? If so, in which of the doctrines enumerated has he effected a reform? Again, you deny. So this uh, is resting on the idea that the uh, expressions of the Tathagata, of the Buddha, were the uh, supreme statement of Dhamma for this age, and that it cannot be improved upon or reformed, which of course um, opens the door. This this position held held by the Uttara Patakas opens the door to new doctrines, and is again could be seen as a precursor of Mahayana. Finally, there's one more that could be seen here as a precursor not only of Mahayana, but of Vajrayana and of Tantra, that was held by some of the Andakas and Vatulyakas, that sexual relations may be entered upon with a united resolve. And this is explained as meaning that sexual relations may be entered into out of a feeling of sympathy or compassion, not passion merely. And by those who are worshipping as it may be at some Buddha shrine, and aspire to be united in their future lives. And do you imply that, this is the Theravadan reply, do you imply that a united resolve may be undertaken which does not benefit a recluse, does not become a bhikkhu, or that it may be undertaken by one who has cut off the root of rebirth, meaning an arahant, or when it is a resolve that would lead to a parajika offense, or when it is a resolve by which life may be slain, theft committed, lies, slander, harsh words, burglary, robbery, highway robbery, adultery, sacking and looting a village and town. You must be more discriminating in your use of this term, united resolve. This is important because one of the, one of the, the Vinaya rules for a monk, of course, monks are forbidden by one of the Parajika rules, the most serious rules from having sexual intercourse. But the only rule that touches on what a monk may teach or promulgate, it's a Pachitya offense, a middling class offense, for a monk to teach that uh, what, what has been declared by the Buddha as a hindrance is not a hindrance, meaning sensu indulgement in sensuality. The, the one point that the Buddha felt was important enough to make a Vinaya rule uh, regulating the teaching. So there were already some branches who were disregarding that and were opening the door to the, uh, the kind of tantric approach. So this, um, this book, 
is available, as I said, in English translation. It's an interesting study, and it's one of our principal sources for knowledge about the, the other schools of Buddhism, which in a way is kind of an unfortunate limitation because many of these schools, we only have descriptions of their doctrines from their adversaries. There's this book from the Theravada, and there's a similar sort of text from the Sarvastivada called the Vibhasa that has a section on that deals with the um, heresies of different schools. Uh, many of the other schools, their own writings are lost or very fragmentary. So we're relying on these sorts of works to give us some image of what these different schools were teaching. But this uh, also served for the purpose within the, the uh, Theravadan Sangha later. It served a, a purpose, first of all, of clarifying and specifying the exact position of the Theravada on many of these fine points. And many of these controversies actually center on very fine points of Abhidhamma. And it's kind of the final say, canonically, the commentaries then, of course, add another layer. And it also served as a debate manual so that a bhikkhu who was encountering proponents of the other schools would come already prepared with uh, arguments to attempt to debate and refute uh, positions that were held to be heretical. So I just wanted to add this um, as a kind of addendum to the previous talk to complete the picture of the work of the, the Third Council.